Well, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. And thank you all for joining us. For me, Sandy Yanon here uh, for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry, I'm joining you on Sunday, March 20th, uh, in anticipation of tomorrow, March 21st, the celebration of World Poetry Day. Today, we here at Cultivating Voices Live Poetry have the unesteemed absolute privilege to be able to assemble some of the most prominent voices in Ukrainian poetry with their translators, as well as to provide a space for you to respond with your voices in our live open mic following our features for our Sunday edition, our reading with Lost Horse Press, this is Poets in their Contemporary Ukrainian Poetry Series. And as I mentioned, in conjunction with World Poetry Day, which we will celebrate tomorrow. Lost Horse Press for a number of years has been publishing, as I mentioned, the most prominent voices in Ukrainian poetry and we have the privilege today to welcome a number of those poets as well as their translators. Let me just let you know the names of the folks we'll be hearing from today, and then we will get started with our reading. We have Irina Staravoit and the, her translator, Grace Mahoney, Ali Kinsella and Zvini Orlowski, who have been the translators of Naitalka Velasurkovic's poetry and Vitali Chernetsky. We will then hear, hoping they are arrive um, from Odessa, Boris and Ludmila uh, Kers Kersansky with their translators, Boris Dreluk, and Diane Zeus. I wanna mention for all of you today that when we started Cultivating Voices Live Poetry, we did it with an intention to provide a space for people to respond to the, to the events that were transpiring around the pandemic, shutting everything down. We have continued on through a number of different world events and responded to those world events. And I know that each of you has a very different relationship with the atrocities that the world continues to witness in Ukraine. Some of us in the room have family, friends, um, humbly through our human connections to people experiencing the unimaginable. We connect together here today through poetry and today's reading is truly an opportunity to come together, to be in community and to stand in solidarity with not only the poets joining us today, but with all the people in Ukraine. I'm reminded of what inspired my sister and I to start cultivating voices. And that was a quotation from the poet Muriel Rukeyser in times of Christ from her book, The Life of Poetry. In times of crisis, we summon our strength. Poetry continues to provide all of us strength as we move through 
these, as I said, unimaginable times. That's the first line in Rukeyser's The Life of Poetry in the introduction. But the last line in that introduction is, and then I began to say what I believe. Today, we will be hearing examples of those that embody and are emblematic of those most striking words where we will hear people saying what they believe. I encourage you all to look at the chat for information on how to purchase the books in the contemporary Ukrainian poetry series from Lost Horse Press, as well as an opportunity for you to make a donation to Penn Ukraine. And so without further ado, let me turn to our first pairing of the poet and translator. It is my absolute humble privilege to welcome Irina Starovoit and Grace Mahoney. And here is a little bit about the two of them. Irina Starovoit is a poet, essayist, and associate professor in the Department of Cultural Studies at Ukrainian Catholic University. Born in Lviv, Ukraine, she made her poetry debut with the book, No Longer Limpid, which was well-received by critics and reserved her a place within the new generation of writers since Ukraine's independence. Starovoit's work has been featured in several poetry anthologies and individual poems have been translated and published in Polish, Lithuania, English, and Armenian as well as being set to music. She was a research associate on the Memory at War project in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures at the University of Groningen from 2012 to 2013 in the Netherlands, where she completed her 2014 collection of poetry, the Groningen Manuscript. Her book from the contemporary Ukrainian poetry series is a field of foundlings. And it was the first volume in Lost Horse Press's dual language series. Joining Irina is Grace Mahoney, who is the series editor of the Lost Horse Press contemporary Ukrainian poetry series, a scholar and translator of Ukrainian and Russian literature, and a PhD candidate in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures at the University of Michigan. As I mentioned, she is the translator of Irina's book, A Field of Families, published by Lost Horse Press in 2017. Would you please welcome these two astounding women to share Irina's work with us today? Dear unknown friends, I'm, I'm so humbled to be here today, and I thank you for your solidarity of listening. It's a very important moment for me sitting now in Lviv, which is relatively safe as of now, but still air sirens are coming almost two, three, four times per day, every day. And um, under the missiles uh, I, are my colleagues and under occupations are my colleagues in other bigger and smaller cities of Ukraine. This is very challenging time for us. This is already the 25th day of this total war of destruction. And one might, might say that it's not time for metaphors. So maybe the only thing I can say that my poems, which were written prior to these 25 days, they now sound a little bit more literal, I would say, than metaphoric. Let me start. Хлопчаки, дипломати, з емоціями ему, вам не втямки, що можна народитися в газовій камері і замість того, щоб здохнути, рости як котигорошки, накачати і копнути футбольного глобуса світу. 
що можна любити зі сходу на захід, вивчати дифузію правди і кривди на летальних невипадках повсякдення, приймаючи від вас співчуття і гуманітарку зі слів. І можна в одному поколінні перейти з чогось газоподібного у вогненну воду і сланець. Ми – народ енергоносій. Хлопчаки-дипломати, з країн, де сідає сонце. Тепер у вас у всіх, на всіх один дипломат. Шукайте зілля на людське божевілля. Дивіться і не відводьте погляду. Архівуйте скріншоти, як наші хлопці, також кімнатні, ніби рослини, раптом ростуть на війну, стають кактусами, агавами, потім текілою. Як сивіють наші діти, як вугляться наші міста, як мерці падають з неба, як живі вкопуються в землю, перший янгол вид свій закриває. Як вам страшно, комфортно по той бік екрану. Thank you, Irina. <clears throat> and it's hard not to be emotional right now. I credit our friendship and collaboration with the seed that began this series. And it's been my honor to edit the series and bring help bring Ukrainian literature to uh, English readers. And here is the translation of that poem. Diplomat boys with ostrich inclinations, you are clueless that someone could be born in a gas chamber and instead of dying, grows like Koti Horoshko to pump and kick the soccer globe of the world. Clueless that one can love from east to west, that one can learn the difference between right and wrong through the little casualties of everyday life, accepting condolences from you and the humanitarian aid of words. Clueless that in a single generation, one can transform from something gaseous into fiery water and shale. We, the people, are the energy source. Diplomat boys from countries where the sun sets, now you're all just one diplomat toy. Search for the cure to human madness. Look at us and don't look away. Archive the screenshots of how our boys, domestic as houseplants, suddenly grow to war and become cocti, agave, and then tequila. How our children turn gray, how our cities burn like coal, how the dead fall from the sky, how the living burrow in their earth. The first angel covers his face. How terrifyingly comfortable it is to you on the other side of the screen. The next one. Западеться земля. Западенці відступим на захід. Хід події перетрублять комахи, а ну перейми. Оприсутнивши в оші, будем чупри гребенити заки, не відчинять голярні, де змиємо голови ми. Чужина – все, що схочеш, коли перестанеш хотіти. Батьківщина – що зможеш, коли перестанеш могти, перейти його вплав, океан, що збирає поти, інтернетні листи і кириличні наші діти. Лиш не кифор з криниці, як птаха, ні сіє, ні жне, і поточений шашелем зруб тратить пам'ять, і грудень, і Христос на розп'ятті кривавить, і віри не йме, ніби той, хто його породив, і вбиває, і любить. The earth collapses on itself. We westerners return westward. The course of events will be eaten by termites. Try and stop them. We comb the lice from our forelocks until exhausted, until the barber shop opens and we wash our heads. Mm -hmm. a, foreign uh, a foreign land, everything you desire until you stop wanting. A homeland, everything you have until you stop being able to cross the ocean by swimming. It collects sweat, internet cables, and our children's Cyrillic. Only Nika for of Krenica, like a bird, neither sows nor reaps. And the termite-ridden frame loses its memory in December, and Christ on the cross is bleeding and cannot believe that the one who created him both kills and loves. Шла висока вода, не дбала про людських дітей, на неторканий берег викидала тіла і глей, Афродіта верталася в піну, досконала лінія згину. 
хто поклявся дійти, той дійшов, хто доплисти доплив. Навіть муравський брат знайшов свій біблійний мотив. Прозираючи крізь цунамі, ніби рентген, покладаючись над тамтамів, пророчий тембр, там, де лінія досконала, все решта хаос. Хто збирається жити, а хто знімає артхаус, як мороз попід шкіру, як піт із несвого чола, за моравським братом пішла неморавська сестра. Коли брат озирнувся, вона не стала стовпом, досконала лінія вигнулась за горизонт. Коли брат запитав самими очима, ти – Сестра погладила воду, і море дало їй пройти. Ти не один, не старайся, один плюс один. Я і є та Єва з твоїх стовбурових клітин. The high water came with no regard for human children. It scattered bodies and clay on the untouched shore. Aphrodite returned to the foam. The line of the fold was perfect. The one who vowed to leave left. The one who would swim swam. Even the Moravian brother caught his biblical drift. Look through the tsunami like an x-ray, count on the tam-tam for its prophetic timber. There, where the line is perfect, the rest is chaos. Someone is going to live, and someone shoots an art house film. Like frost under the skin, like sweat from someone else's brow, a non-Moravian sister followed the Moravian brother. When the brother looked back, she didn't turn into a salt pillar. The perfect line was bent behind the horizon. When the brother asked with his eyes, is it you? The sister stroked the seawater and it let her pass. You are not alone. Don't try so hard. One plus one. I am the eve of your stem cells. А потім вони виростають, діти з очима дорослих. Зайд пізнають по вимові, як зілля за пахом. Вистригають на голо чуби свої дикорослі, заокруглюють голови, ловлять родинки страху. Наука кохання і смерти не йде до лісу. Черпають натхнення з подвійного дна надії. Приводять на світ дітей, одного тісного замісу, котрим до колиски співається «Що з вами в дію?». Кожний наступний рік додає їм по сантиметру. Звільнена кров у жилах вурдиться і скипає. Спочатку житимуть вічно, тоді поховають мертвих. Змучаться бути дітьми і дійсно повиростають. And then they grow up, children with the eyes of adults, recognizing newcomers by their accents, like herbs by scent, shaving forelocks from untamed hair, rounding their heads bare and snagging moles of fear. The faculties of love and death don't run for the hills. They draw inspiration from the hidden drawer of hope. They bring children to a world, a tight piece of dough, and sing to the cradle, what shall I do with you? Every year adds a centimeter. The blood freed in their veins bubbles and boils. At first they will live eternally, then bury their dead. And tired of childhood, indeed, grow up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irina and Grace, for those poems, you know, such striking conscience and consciousness. I'm going to, it's very appropriate to have heard the first collection from the, contemp the contemporary Ukrainian poetry series to start with the first collection and to talk a little bit more about the series and the reading today. It's my unique pleasure to welcome Lost Horse Press's founder and publisher, Christine Holbert to uh, share a little bit about her vision and the significance of today's gathering. Christine, welcome.
Sandy, I, I don't know if Christine is here. I, uh, I just sent her the Zoom link again. I don't know if she's, she's here yet. Phone actually, so. Oh, she's on the phone, okay. So hopefully she's connecting. Okay, good, yeah. Thank you, thank you. She's had so much, she's been so totally overwhelmed by all of this, you know. Well, I'm we're wondering, gonna- I'm wondering if she knows how to unmute her phone. It's not, it, it looks like she's muted. Well, we will work a little behind the scenes to try to support that effort for her. And as maybe, a result- Maybe Grace, sorry to, you know, but, but maybe Grace could tell us a little bit more about the series since, you know, she's been Absolutely. instrumental in, in, in initiating it with, with Christine. Right, thank you. Yeah, Grace, would you mind stepping in for Christine in this moment? I know I've put, uh, put you on the spot. Sure, yeah. I'll just say a few words. Um, I hadn't prepared anything, but, um, you know, essentially my manuscript of Irina's translations found its way to Christine through friends and um, colleagues of hers, poets she works with. And, um, and uh, there was an invitation to try a series. And although Christine has for many years been a publisher of English language poetry, mostly North American poetry. Um, she has Ukrainian heritage and feels a deep uh, commitment to um, helping promote Ukrainian literature um, and the language and the country and the culture and um, uh, the, the multicultures of Ukraine. So um, we work together and um, it, uh, was uh, completely something new for me. Uh, I'm just a lowly graduate student, but um, uh, over the years, we started in 2017, we've been able to procure, you know, really excellent single author volumes of, of Ukrainian, and now our upcoming book will feature Ukrainian and Russian language poetry from the Hersanskis, who are um, poets in Odessa and um, have a very special relationship with both languages. Um, but, you know, and as an editor, it's my task, I feel, to feature um, voices from all over the country and um, women and men and um, uh, give emerging and well-established poets uh, space and encourage emerging translators um, to publish alongside some very well know, known ones. So it's been, we have our 10th book coming out this spring. We have two books, the Hersonsky's uh, book edited by Katie Ferris and Ilya Kaminsky. And, um, uh, and then, um, oh, there's Christine. I was just talking about the series <laughs> briefly, but then I started going on. Finally. <laughs> oh. That was no Welcome, hard. Christine. Glad you made yeah. it. Yeah, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. I was just sharing about our, our spring volumes and that with, with our two publications of spring with the Hersonskis and Oleg Sheha, we will have um, 10 books in the series and we plan to continue. Um, uh, and I just kind of shared about the history of how we got started. And um, <laughs> Yes. So when I when I got the idea for it was quite a long time ago uh, for the series because uh, my parents also I'm going to have to go. Chris, uh, yes, I was going to say before pause yeah. just a moment and turn off your phone because we're hearing that um, interfering yeah. with your speech. Let's see if I can get this off. Can I do it. Oh no. There. Um, all right. Now, sorry, sorry for all the trouble. I don't know what happened. I kept getting a message that said that I was already on the screen, you know, in the chat room, and I could not make it let me in again. It said, sorry, you're already in. So I said, no, no, I'm not. So when I, when I first started publishing poetry books, it was always in the back of my head that I wanted to do something for 
the Ukrainian community in America, and I didn't know what that was, but as, as time went on, it became clear that I should try to publish Ukrainian literature in translation. I knew nothing about translating poetry or publishing it. I was just publishing American poets. So a friend, a mutual friend of ours, Piotr Florczyk, um, a Polish poet, uh, one day said to me, do you know Grace Mahoney? She, she was probably interested in this. So we got together, I, I met Grace through Piotr and we, we talked a bit and both seemed to be on the same page. So we got together and what I didn't know Grace knew because she was in a, in a Ukrainian studies, Slavic and Ukrainian studies program. And she was in Ukraine doing research. And so she had access. So she's our acquisitions person for the series as well as editor. And, um, and then what she doesn't know about publishing, that's the part I fill in. And so we, we make, I think like the two of us together make one publisher. <laughs> one Ukrainian translation publisher, but without the key pieces, uh, you know, so it's lucky we got together. And then my motivation for this whole thing was because my parents were Ukrainian refugees after the Second World War. My mother was from northeastern Ukraine, the part of Ukraine that was hardest hit during Holodomor. Um, somehow, well, somehow they survived by eating grass and baby birds and dirt. And um, the fact that she lived is amazing. And uh, I, I, she, she told me about how horrible it was. And I, I just all of my life have wanted to do something to give back to the Ukrainian people. And when I started this, I had no idea that this was going to happen. And, you know, it's been really hard to this week get phone calls from the British Library who ordered two copies of each of the Ukrainian books and PBS NewsHour um, and these places that I never even dreamed would set their eyes on Lost Horse Press or our books or anything. And while it's wonderful that finally the Ukrainian literature is, is getting recognition, I only wish it was not under these circumstances. This is what's breaking my heart and, and that the people there are, are suffering so badly and the, how brave they are, how my cousin, took her daughter and grandchildren to Warsaw with her car. And I thought they were all going to be staying in, in Poland. I said, you know, I can come there and stay with you for a while. I can try to bring you back. My cousin is about my age and she went back. She dropped off her daughter and the grandchildren and went back. This is how the Ukrainians feel that this is their, their wonderful country and they don't want to they don't want to give it up and every one of them who is able-bodied is staying to defend their their country and so thank you for having this would it be possible for me to put um on the chat uh, the places that we can donate these are reputable um official places to donate. Uh, some are through the Ukrainian bank, um, but most of them are like the Red Cross. Um, you can also donate to Lost Horse Press directly by donating to our uh, PayPal account. And uh, what Grace and I would do with that money is give it to Penn Ukraine, or, or if we hear of a poet who has a, a need, we could send it right to the right to that person. Um, so either way, but is that okay, Sandy? If I can put those, I can't hear you now. We've been yes, we've been mentioning Penn Ukraine before you arrived. Oh, good. And putting that in the chat for folks, and of course, please do put the other. Please do feel free to put the other links uh, for folks to see. Uh, okay. For. Uh, for this humanitarian relief purposes. And thank you, Christine, 
so much for organizing uh, in my in my I, I hadn't said it yet because um, I was waiting for you because I knew uh, I just wanted to share that you know I knew that when you began the series you knew that the poetry of uh, Ukraine mattered but you could not have ever imagined the the urgency with which it would come into striking view um, and that need that that we have for today and as you said uh, of course we're grateful for the recognition of the series but of course we would not want to under these circumstances and we can only we can only hope that that us doing our parts to continue to raise the voices of poetry, the people of Ukraine will, and, and really continue to draw attention, um, support with our monetary, but also with our, with our voices can do, can do what our, what, we can do our parts to end this just unimaginable, unimaginable events that we continue to witness. And as I said, in the as I also said, different people have different connections. Uh, you know, you have family, and other people in the room have family. Um, are living in Ukraine are. Uh, as well as the folks that just have human connection to the to these events, uh, we all are here together in hopes that our poetry and our voices will bring will bring this to an end as soon as soon as possible. As soon as possible. I'm going to move next to. Um, Vitaly and Vitaly Chernetsky. And Vitaly is going to be reading um, his work in the original, uh, in Ukraine, uh, uh, in the original, in his home language, as well as um, his own translations. So let me share with you the illustrious Vitaly Chernetsky. Vitaly completed his PhD in comparative literature and literary theory at the University of Pennsylvania. And prior to joining the faculty at the University of Canvas, he taught at Columbia University and at Miami University in Ohio. Vitaly's research interests are vast and include Russian literature and culture, film, theater, and visual arts, Ukrainian literature and culture, East and Central European literatures and cultures, Central Asian literatures and cultures, the intellectual history of Russia and Ukraine, cultural aspects of globalization. And Vitaly is a past president of the American Association for Ukrainian Studies and the current vice president and scholarly secretary of the Shev Shevchenko Scientific Society in the United States. Would you please, please welcome Vitaly Chernetsky. Thank you so much, uh, Sandy. And thank you uh, for organizing this event and for featuring uh, this uh, uh, series, uh, which thanks to the amazing efforts of Grace and Christine brought contemporary Ukrainian poetry to unprecedented notice and prominence uh, here in the US and uh, beyond it in the English speaking world. I cannot tell you how transformative it was for me personally to see books uh, from the series on the shelves of great independent bookstores around the country. Um, and uh, uh, thank you for this attention now. I uh, am going to read from two books. Uh, one uh, is the second book in the series, uh, uh, Selected Poetry by Yuri Andruhovich, uh, which I uh, collaborated on 
with Ostap Kiny. I translated half of the poems in the book. Ostap translated the other half. And then I will read uh, a little bit from a, a book in progress uh, that is also coming out in the series by another great poet, Ostap Slavinsky. So a little bit about Yuri Andruhovich. Uh, he was born in 1960, and he is one of Ukraine's uh, greatest acclaimed living authors. He first got his recognition as a poet, but he has also received considerable acclaim as both uh, a writer of prose fiction and as an essayist. In addition to his poetry, I have translated two of his novels, and I'm now working on a third one, which is structured as a cycle of uh, self-standing short stories, and two of those have already been published. This uh, book from the series, Songs from a Dead Rooster, came out uh, in 2018, and it contains uh, poetry of his from two different periods. I will read two poems from the later period, and each poem in uh, this uh, book uh, has a title that is not in Ukrainian. Uh, first one is Life is a Long Song. So I'll first read the Ukrainian and then the translation. Divitsa, a tsay taki viznov, що боїться смерті, показав на мене пальцем один розумаха з нетиповим близьком в очах. Зрештою, то могли бути скельця. Останнім часом мене люблять публічно запитувати про найінтимніше. Наприклад, який мій найтягший гріх, що мені снилося із середини п'ятниці. Чи подобається мені найвище керівництво країни? Чи хотів би я бути сумлінням нації? І чого я боюся? Відповідаю переважно так, як можу. Коли розмова при чарці або спохмілля, то значно відвертіше. Коли на тверезу голову, то вигадливіше і химерніше переважно. Того разу я сказав, що боюся смерті близьких людей. Головним чином від нещасного випадку. Хоча насправді наше життя довге, ні пісня про довбуша, і смерть мусить сприйматися, ніби розв'язка, давно очікувана через те, що стомлюєшся співати. Але в цитуванні найважливіше це своєчасно поставити крапку, про що розумаха знає ще від батьків наставників. І поставивши крапку, де хоче, самостверджується, як може. Він визнав, дивіться всі на його страх. Так, я справді не боюся сказати, чого я боюся. Так, я справді боюся нічних телефонних дзвінків та імейлів із записом sad news у суб'єкті. Дивіться всі на мій страх. От, як я боюся. В усьому ж іншому це просто пісня. Довга прекрасна пісня про шлях до прірви. Чи, скажімо, не менш прекрасна про кулю в потилиці. Life is a long song. Look. This guy admitted that he's scared of death. A certain wise guy pointed his finger at me, a weird glint in his eyes. I suppose it could have been the glasses. Lately, they like, like to ask me in public about the most intimate things. For example, my greatest sin, what I dreamt of from Wednesday to Friday. If I like the leaders of my country, would I like to be the conscience of the nation and what I'm scared of? I usually answer the best I can. When the conversation's over a drink or after one, much more openly. When sober in an artsy and fanciful way as a rule. This time I said that I was afraid of the death of those close to me, mainly through accidents. Although really our life is long, like a folk song about Dovbush and death should be viewed as a resolution long awaited because you got tired of singing. But the most important thing when you quote is timely putting the full stop, which this wise guy still remembers from his mentors. And putting the full stop where he pleases, he seeks to assert himself. He admitted it. Look, everybody, look at his fear. Indeed, I am really not afraid to say what I'm scared of. Yes, I'm really scared of the phone ringing at night and emails with sad news in the subject line. Look, everybody, look at my fear. That is how I'm afraid. But apart from everything else, this is just a song, a long and beautiful song on the road to the abyss, 
or let's say a no less beautiful about a bullet in the head. And the second poem from this collection is Ver Wolf Sutra, which is an allusion to a Sunflower Sutra by uh, Allen Ginsberg. Німецькою мовою це називається Hochzitz. Така дерев'яна будка на підвищенні, звідки краще стріляється по кабанах. Дихи кажуть, ніби по оленях. Але їх так багато. Вони всюди, ці маленькі сторожеві вежі. Таке враження, що тутешній люд живе винятково полюваннями або мріями. Про полювання. А ще тут водилося багато лисиць. Одна з них перебігала шосе першого ж вечора. Їм підсипають чогось такого від сказу. Їм уже не вдасться сказитися. А ще ці руїни – це колишні військові містечка, зараз зарослі хвощами казарми, стрільбища, плац, КТП, КПП, настійні розписи в гімнастичних залах, настійні написи в умивальниках і сральниках. Так хочеться підняти вказівний палець і повідомити. Попіл імперії. Тим часом йдеться про речі значно простіші. О шостій ранку, в Москві була восьма, їх виганяли з казар. Потім увесь той ідіотизм з піснями, фізарядкою, вмиванням, довбання мозгів, прибирання, території, розлізло масло сніданку, день до вечора, скільки днів до приказу. Тим часом йдеться про рядових Мухамедярова, Федотова і Перевертня, чиї імена навіки, та не навіки ж, записані на табличках «Буття» разом з номерами їхніх камазів. Федотов був посередині. Справа Мухамедяров. По ліву руку Федотова переверти. З першими двома все ясно – росіянин, татарин. Але хто третій? Куди з таким прізвищем? Ніхто не любив перевертня за вроджену хитрість і дурне прізвище. Вони не могли не сміятися з такого прізвища. І не сам не знав, що воно означає. Але німецькою мовою це буде Вервольф з чорним піднебінням, пострах навколишніх сіл і містечок, романтичний герой сказок і балад. О, незнищенний, майже безсмертний вовкулаку, утікай, поки вони зберуться на тебе облавою, поки приціляться зі своїх дерев'яних веж. Дім більній збіжен. Я вірю, ти зможеш. Воскресне. Стань собою, перевертні. Вервольф Сутра. In German it's called Hochzitz, a kind of wooden cabin on stilts from which one can shoot wild boar more easily. Some say dear. But there are so many of them, they're everywhere, these little watchtowers. It seems people here live only for hunting or for dreams about hunting. There are also lots of foxes here. One of them ran across the highway on the very first night. They add something to the treats for them against rabies so that they would never see them going crazy. But also the ruins, those former garrison towns, overgrown with snake grass, barracks, firing ranges, marching grounds, outbuildings, guard posts, painted walls of the gyms, scribbling on the walls of the washrooms and shit rooms. You attempted to raise your index finger and declaim, ashes of empires. Meanwhile, this is about much simpler things. At six in the morning, eight by Moscow time, they drove them out of the barracks. Then all that idiocy with songs, morning calisthenics, and washing, brainwashing, cleaning, the grounds, the misshapen butter of breakfast, the day until evening, so many days until the end of your term. This time it's about privates Muhammadyarov, Fedotov, and Pereverti, whose names for eternity, really for eternity, are inscribed on the tablets of being, along with the numbers of the Kamaz trucks. Fedotov was in the middle, Mohamedyarov on the right, on Fedotov's left side, Pereverti. With the first two, it's clear, a Russian, a Tatar. But that third one, what on earth can you do with a surname like that? No one liked Pereverti for his innate cunning and stupid surname. They couldn't help laughing at a name like that. He didn't know himself what it meant. But in German, it will be Verwolf with a black palette, the terror of all the surrounding hamlets and towns, a romantic hero of fairy tales and ballads. Oh, indestructible, almost immortal werewolf. Escape before they gather to round you up, before they aim at you from their wooden towers. Discharge day is certain. I know you can do it. 
resurrect, become yourself, perverte. And now um, several shorter poems by a wonderful uh, poet, Ostap Slovinsky. Yuri Androkovich is from Ivano-Frankivsk, which is a city in Western part of Ukraine. Ostap Slovinsky is from Lviv, uh, also in the West of Ukraine, uh, where Irena Stravoit is also based. And like Irena, Ostap is both a poet and a literary scholar. He's also an acclaimed translator, primarily from Bulgarian and Polish. He is, for example, the Ukrainian translator of the Nobel Prize winning uh, prose writer Olga Tokarchuk. So uh, this is a book that I'm also collaborating with, uh, with another dear colleague, Irina Shovalova, who is a wonderful poet in her own right, and uh, one of the poets represented in this anthology with her own poetry. Um, here we're working on Ostap Slovinsky's writings. And so three, sorry, four short poems by Ostap. Ми проїхали місто, повне подарункових вогнів. І тепер, коли майже все світло позаду, я просто прошу тебе приручити мені якусь тварину і навчити мене гратися з нею. Я волів би бути її швидкоплинним тілом, їхати співаючи на осліп, як п'яний велосипедист у зливу, коли він у зв'язні клятві б'є себе в серце і слухає, як воно гуде. Волів би підніматися з нею на мокру палубу, шукати тебе очима, смішний, як іграшковий вулкан, що бризкає малиновим соком. Волів би повернути все, трохи змінити нахил вітрил і мчати під старою примарною назвою і викидати на берег радісні перви. Проте вертаюся і засинаю, встромившись носом у кубку теплих клітин. Яке світло осідає на соній шерсті, у яку красу витікає звичайне земне життя. We drove through a city brimming with festive lights. And now, when almost all light is behind us, I simply ask you, tame for me some animal. Teach me how to play with it. I'd like to become its swift moving body, ride blindly singing, a drying cyclist in a rainstorm, swearing incoherently. He punches his, at his own heart, listens to it hum. I'd like to climb with it on a glistening boat deck, see you out with my eyes, comical like a toy volcano spewing raspberry juice. Would like to bring everything back, change slightly the angle of the sails, then speed away under an old ghostly name, throwing joyous pearls on the shore. Instead, I return and doze off, pushing my nose into a bundle of warm cells. What a light settles on the sleepy fur. What a beauty is that into which mundane early life empties itself. Стер. Чогось із носа йшла кров, ніби серце знову шукало із тебе вихід. Я спочатку нічого не розумів, гадав, ти плачеш, намагався спинити таксі, глузували ринви, мені подуючи, гасли квадрати кав'ярень, дорожні знаки вказували один на одного, дзвіночки риби, золоті космонавти, слянка води з накришеним стеарином, збаламучена різдвяна іграшка. І ти всередині різдвяної іграшки, яка виконує свою механічну радість. Піанола Марлен сама зіграє елегію хроброго снігу, сама приструнить погоду і візьме тебе на гачок. Моя сфера повна диму і вогнів, різної випадкової музики. Серце легені вібрують, як прикордонні мости, з ночі ще теплі і мокрі, бранці власного руху, опудала хмар, соломі нібики. Nosebleed for some reason. Was the heart again looking for ways to exit you? At first, I was not understanding a thing, thought you were crying, tried hailing a cab, the gutters guffawed, applauding me, square coffee houses faded away, street signs pointed to one another, bells and fishes, golden cosmonauts, a glass of water with crumbles of candle wax, a shaken snow globe, and you inside that globe which performs its mechanical joy. 
the piano Marlene will play an elegy of brave snow, tame the weather, and then get you hooked. My sphere full of smoke and lights of all sorts of random music. Heart and lungs vibrate like border bridges, still warm and wet after the night, captives of their own movement, fake clouds, straw bulls. Щось таке почорніле, трохи більше за дитячу долоню, ніби обрамлення для якогось дрібного життя. Я довго дивлюсь, аж доки впізнаю її. Так, це праща. Каштанова праща, єдина річ, яку батько зробив для мене, коли я вечорами боявся ходити повз ліс. Моя праща, моя перша і остання зброя, яку я місяцями грів у спітнілій кишені. На, сказав батько. Носи, доки перестанеш боятися, а потім не викидай, заховай десь. Пращо, скажи, ти прийшла, бо впізнала мене? Ти вчула мене за якоюсь нашою єдиною спільністю? Внюшила мене, як покинути пес, що плентається позаду, навчене охороняти? Так, мені знов страшно, пращо. Something black with age, a bit bigger than the palm of a child's hand like a frame for some sort of petty, insignificant life. I stare at length, and finally I recognize it. Yes, this is the slingshot, a chestnut slingshot, the only thing father made for me, when in the evenings I was afraid of walking past a forest. My first and last weapon, which I warmed for months in a sweat-filled pocket. There, father said, carry it until you stop being afraid, and then don't throw it away, hide it somewhere. Tell me, Slingshot, did you come because you recognized me? Did you sense me behind uh, some kind of united being of ours? Did you smell me like an abandoned dog who trudges a few steps behind, trained to protect? Yes, Slingshot, I am scared again. And the last poem for today. As Nadi, you sure вона ніби кінь, ні кинути її на піску, ні брати у човен. Ще покірніше, ніж тоді, коли везла нас на собі, майже не просячи їсти. Та й не її провина, що ми не знайшли тут нічого, а вже час відчалювати. Може, коли її відпустити, вона повернеться до якогось свого дому? Якого дому? And what shall we do about hope? It is like a horse, can neither leave it behind in the sand, nor take it aboard a boat. Even more docile now than back when it carried us on its back, almost never asking for food. It is not its fault that we found nothing here. And now it is already time for the boat to sail. Perhaps when we set it free, it will return to a home of its own. What home? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vitaly, for um, offering numerous, numerous voices in the Ukrainian poetry series and to, to give us, you know, different perspectives that the poets the poets offer it's like it's 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 amazing to be able to hear just not not only um the translation of course but the home language and to hear uh, multiplicity of poets is is just is just so incredible and i'm so grateful for your participation and that we could all gather today um everyone please make sure that you check out the books in the contemporary Ukrainian poetry series. They are, as Christine has said, they are actually flying off the shelves right now. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and, and as you're hearing, as you're hearing the incredible prismatic perspectives that each of these poets brings um, to the human endeavor, so please do 
look at the series from Lost Horse Press and make your purchases of the books, as well as if you have the resources today, the link has just been put into the chat um, as well. This is a benefit to support uh, Penn Ukraine and the poets um, and writers of Ukraine. And we've had links in the chat during the reading. So if you have the resources, please do. Please do be generous in support of um, our siblings, our siblings. Well, my understanding is that our maybe on we get into the room. Um, there is some there is some technological issue going on, um, but I'm going to invite, uh, and I, I do hope that they're going to be that we're going to be able to connect with them. Uh, I'm going to, in the interest of time, however, I'm going to ask um, Ludmilla's translator Diane Seuss to share her poems um, with us today and and sorry that we're not getting to hear um, to hear both of your voices in tandem um, if they're able to connect which I hope they will by the end of the program we'll certainly um, come back and hear from them but um, I'm going to ask us to listen to Diane and I'm so grateful for Diane being with us today. Uh, Y'all know that she's been on the program before uh, with uh, Kelly Russell Agadin and Risa Denenberg for a new book showcase from her, incre her in in incredible uh, award-winning collection, Frank's, Frank Sonnets. So let me share with you a little bit about, um, a little bit about Ludmila uh, Karzanski, and a little bit about Diane, and then hear the poems. Ludmila Karzanski was born in Tiraspol, and she is an award winning author of three collections of poetry. A professional translator from English, she's translated into Russian the poetry of numerous authors, including. I think of, of a name that you likely all know in this room, the Nobel laureate, Seamus Heaney. In the United States, Ludmila's poems have appeared um, in numerous anthologies and journals, and she lives in Odessa, Ukraine. Her latest collection is The Country Where Everyone's Name is Fear, Selected Poems from Lost Horse Press, April 2022, which she co-authored with her husband, Boris Kurzonski, which is edited by the poets, Katie Ferris and Ilya Kaminsky. So please do check um, this unique collaboration between um, this husband and wife and purchase this collection and now to hear a few of the poems of Ludmia's is Diane Seuss, whom, as I mentioned, its most recent collection is Frank Sonnets from Gray Wolf Press last year. Diane was a 2020 Guggenheim Fellow and received the John Updike Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters in 2021. And there are numerous other accolades to share, but we are so grateful to have her with us today to share the work of Ludmilla Kierzonski. Thank you, Diane. Thank you so much, um, <clears throat> Sandy and everybody who uh, is reading today and listening in. Um, I'm so concerned about Ludmilla and, and her spouse, Boris, and hope they will be able to uh, attend at some point. But I'm going to read um, my two translations of poems by uh, Ludmilla. Um, and, uh, you know, it will be really uh, more anemic without her voice as part of this, but um, the poems are incredible. And 
I'm so honored to, um, to have gotten to work with them as a baby translator and also to get to know her through her work. The first poem is called Apple. Ira Karmayova died in first grade. The straight A students were assigned to her funeral. Perfect grades, just me and Genka. We'd never seen a dead person before. Ira, the dead girl, wore lace, a lace dress within her jewelry box coffin, white tights. Across her forehead, a wide white ribbon, a ribbon as if she'd been wounded in war. A bandaged girl in a black and white war film. Had she not died, they would have tied the ribbon in a bow. That was the thought I held in my mind. I could hear the adults whisper. They whispered of a brain tumor that her skull had been opened like a chest full of treasure. The ribbon, satin, white. I was fascinated by it or by what hid beneath it. A toy that did not want to be found. Ira lay there, a big doll, sun-kissed. The adults whispered, whispered about Ira's body how she now appeared longer than before, almost too long for the box. But Ira had always been tall, a tall one, I thought. Ira's mother kissed me and Genka with salty lips, lips cold and white with salt. Then as if suddenly remembering, she handed us a large apple. One apple for the two of us, me and Genka, two. How were we expected to share a single fruit? A mystery I held all the way home. And this is the second and last poem. Um, I did a, a draft of a translation of it, and then um, Ilya wrote me and said, just so you know, in the original, it, there's a rhyme scheme. <laughs> and then I was like, oops. So um, I have attempted a rhyme scheme in this poem, Keeping House, that he told me had a kind of lightness or levity, but I think given the situation now, the poem feels more shadowed. Keeping house. Every time he leaves the house, she cleans, tosses out his old papers. Why does he need all these time-worn books? She drags out the sweeper, whisks away the scraps. He's only one man and all this. Then Eureka, under one pile, a sardine can, a world atlas and a guidebook for Riga. He circles back home, back home, everything is missing. His papers, his books, his sack of maps. Where's my black folder? He's fishing for it. Did you throw away my black folder? Yes, I'm sorry, it's gone. Her broomstick in one hand, wet rag in the other, her lips hold back a yawn. He crawls through a spill of old photos on the floor. Here, a small girl with a teddy bear. There, a grandpa in uniform, cap pushed down over his gray hair. Where are my parents? Dear God, my parents. You're going mad, she says. Come to the table. Your soup is getting cold. 
get off the floor. Your parents are dead, Shlema. Thank you. And my love and prayers to um, all the poets here today and the poets in Ukraine. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Diane. Just, uh, just astounding to hear. Uh, I, I too, I too, I too long to hear her voice uh, in tandem with yours. Um, and as with exceptional poetry, we can tell from the translation only what we would be hearing otherwise. You know, I years ago. Um, I, in 1991, I actually went to Moscow and St. Petersburg in a young poets tour. And I, I hadn't studied Russian language yet. And then it made me want to become a translator after. Um, so I studied for a while in my PhD program to, to do that. But what I learned being with the poets, um, for those two weeks was that poetry transcends the language. Like you can hear, you can hear the music even if you do not know the language. And that's why we so were interested today to bring together um, everyone reading in their home language and the translations. And of course, we want to connect and know. So without the translators, we, um, we could not have uh, as rich an experience. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing Ludmila's work with us today. Uh, again, we are hoping that the Kirzlanskis will be able to join us. Uh, we're, st we're still trying to connect. So I'm going to, I'm just altering the, I'm, I'm, I'm riffing today, my friends. I'm riffing off of my script. Um, I'm gonna turn next to Ali Kinsella and, and Zvinia Orlowski to share, the, to share their work um, that they have done as translators in the contemporary Ukrainian poetry series. They have been the translators of the work of Natalka, Natalka, um, Natalka Bolskivets. And I'm so grateful that both of them, we have heard from uh, Natalka's book uh, when they were here with us earlier this um, earlier last year, and I am really grateful to be able to have the both of them back here today. Again, um, I wish under different circumstances, but to share their work in translation as well. Uh, we will be we will get to hear the uh, the in we will get to hear in the home language and the translations from both of them. So a little bit about, a little bit about um, Ali and Zvinia, and I'll let them share um, more about Natalka with you. Ali Kinsella has been translating from Ukrainian for nine years. Her published works include essays, poetry, monographs, and subtitles to various films with Otsipkin, she translated Vasil Lasinski's chapbook, The Maiden After Hours from 2017. And she won the 2019 Kavali Prize Fund Prize for her translation of Teres Prokasko's Anna's Other Days. She holds an MA in Slavic studies from Columbia University where she focused on Eastern European history and literature and wrote a thesis on the intersection of feminism and nationalism in small states. Ali is a former Peace Corps volunteer and has lived in both Western and Central Ukraine for nearly five years and now is joining us today from 
Chicago. Zvinia Orlowski is a Pushcart Prize poet, translator, and founding editor of Four Way Books. She's the author of six poetry collections, including Bad Harvest, which was named a 2019 Massachusetts Books Award must read, and the award-winning collections Silver Tone and Convertible Night, Flurry of Stones. Her first collection, A Handful of Bees, was reprinted as a Carnegie Mellon classic contemporary. And as mentioned, she is the co-translator with Ali Kinsella from the Ukraine of Eccentric Days of Hope and Sorrow Selected Poems, which was published by Lost Horse Press in 2021. Would you please welcome back Ali and Zvinia. Hi, Sandy and everyone else. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all again, of course, uh, under less than ideal circumstances. This is the book that um, Zvinia and I will be reading from today. We published this with Christine and Grace at Lost Horse Press in the fall. Um, and we were actually joined in the series by our, our fall contemporaries. This is another great volume. Um, they're not, they don't have the chance to read with us today, but I encourage you to seek it out. Um, Natalka is, um, a resident of the city of Kiev. She was not born there, but she's lived there most of her life. And the last I heard from her um, about a week and a half ago, she was not leaving. She, um, her daughter and her granddaughter have gotten to safety, but she and her son are remaining in Kiev. She does not intend to leave. Uh, and with that, I think we will just begin. This first poem is called February and um, a little background information. It's, um, in, oh gosh, 2000, 2001, um, journalist Heor Higungadze was murdered, um, most likely uh, on the president's orders, and um, his body was found headless in the woods outside of Kiev in February. Люди. Останні місяць довгої зими переживаємо. Все таки і ми у чомусь завинили. І з питми виходить ніж, як місяць. Гітара бранькоє про трупи і лиси, і на касетах наші голоси. Хто винен менше, більше, навпаки, хто винен більше, менше. І з руки повзуть роки, не наче черв'яки, і все-таки за все надходить кара. Нещасня земна, земля під невільних снів, мерзених слів, одрубаних голів, обпаленої кислотою шкіри. Твій солов'їний вирвано язик, і тільки мат, і свіст, і п'яний крик доносяться з-під княжої порифірі. Моя княгине, жона риб і жаб, твій кожен син негідник або раб, кому віддатись і кого любити над берегами вічної реки? У гальтери майори їх жінки, і в закордонних школах їхні діти. Що виросте з розкиданий колось? Нам голе поле бачить привелось, але жнива таки побачить хтось, і пройде серп ходою супостата, і замолотять ципом на току, і хліб на вишиваним рушнику лежатиме, як голова оттята. Thank you, Ali. Um, before we read it in English, I just wanted to say again, you know, thank you, Ali, for being able to work on this project for the past two years. It's been amazing um, to work with you. And Sandy, thank you as always for hosting this sorely needed uh, community get together of readings. Your work is really appreciated and uh, heartfelt. Thank you so much to Christine and Grace for putting together the, the blessing, the international messenger that has become Lost Horse Press. I am honored beyond words to have worked uh, with you. So thank you everyone to thank all poets uh, and attendees. So now uh, the poem in, in English, February. It's the last month of a long winter will survive. After all, we were at fault for something. From the darkness, a knife emerges like the moon. A guitar strums about corpses and forests while our voices endure on cassettes. 
Some owe less, others more, some more, others less. Out of our hands, years crawl like worms, yet there's punishment for everything. Unfortunate earth of enslaved dreams, of nasty words, decapitations of skin burned with acid. Your nightingale tongue ripped out and only Russian curses, a whistle, a drunken cry heard from under imperial robes. My princess, wife of fish and frogs, you're every son a scoundrel or a slave. Whom to give oneself to and whom to love on the banks of the eternal river. Accountants, majors, their wives, their children sent off to foreign schools. What will grow from the scattered grain? We had to see the naked field. Though some will get to see the harvest, the sickle will go the way of the foe. They'll beat with flails on the threshing floor and on an embroidered cloth, our bread will lie like a severed head. I forgot to mention that um, a loaf of bread on a ritual cloth is a symbol of Ukrainian hospitality. Uh, this is called Night Plains. Нічні літаки. Нічні літаки прилітають незримо. Снеги опадають на вулиці міста. О перший загасають бліди ліхтарі. Зникають останні трамваї. Тепер лишаються тільки будинки поснули. Дерева геть гемні та серце гаряче, як грудочка тепла живої землі. Ці дні, наче роки, минають поволі. Ці дні невиразний туманів, сніхів, сниданків, обідів, подій монотонних. Але прислухайся, колись уночі повернуться в брами трагічні ключі і видива спогадів нам незнайомих постануть криз гуркять нічних литаків. Освітиться в серце розбите вікно далекої школи, чи може суворо, чи може майдані розхитаних вулиць, чи може галявини зимних лісів, і гори ослаблих ламки голосів співатимуть з неба старі колискові і перші слова неживих букварів. Нічні літаки пролітають далеко, лишаючи видива дивні, сриблісти, неначе з ними в шинелах. Солдатські в констабірних куртках, лахмітіх, жіночим. О, ні! У ясному святковому вбранні. Колонії дитячі, дитя за дитям. Призначення, зміст. Просто образ життя у півночі в час літаків фіалкових. Night planes. Overhead night planes fly past unseen, while snow falls on city streets. At 1 a.m., pale streetlights die and the last trams disappear. Now, only sleeping buildings remain among ill-lit trees. But the heart is hot, a warm lump of living earth. These days, like years, pass slowly. These days, obscured by fog, snow, breakfast, lunches, monotonous events. But listen, sometimes at night, Tragedy's keys will return to their gates. Unfamiliar memories will emerge through the plane's roar. The broken window of a distant school or maybe a church will light in your heart, or maybe plazas of rickety streets, glades of winter forests, choirs of weak and fragile voices will sing old lullabies from the sky, first words of vanished first primers. Night planes fly far, leave behind strange silvery ghosts in soldiers' overcoats, in concentration camp jackets, in women's rags, in bright holiday clothes, columns of children, child after child, to what destination? A vision of life at midnight in the hour of violet plains. This poem is untitled in the Ukrainian. So хишай витончується шкіра, як і життя на обрисах облич недавно рідних. 
Божевільна віра, вся молодість, мов ніжний, тужний клич розгубленого звіра. І смага, і задума, і тисна, злиденність астрономчиків її далін, і свіжо пофарбована весна ярів кітневих із окраїн дальних, на всьому знак витрат непроминальних. Хто стане перегноєм рідних днів, а хто поповнить звалище собою міські, де крематорною трубою завод вінчає житлових масив, і шлях до раю б'ється, ніби стяг, і понад пеклом сяє саркофаг. The skin gets drier and thins, as does life on contours of recently familiar faces. All of youth is crazy faith, like the wistful cry of a lost animal. And thirst and contemplation and the cramped poverty of food shops, cafeterias, the freshly painted spring of April ravines from far off outskirts, everywhere signs of impassable loss. Someone will become the hummus of native fields. Others will fill the city waste sites where a factory crowns housing with a crematorium pipe. And the path to heaven flutters like a banner and a gavagus shines over hell. This is the last poem we'll read. Maybe you've heard it. It's called Knife. Niche. Ніж, щоб накраїти хліб, ніж майструвати сопілку, ніж, щоб добити гняхня вовком скаличене. Так гола, суха і пісна гніниться раптом поверхня потом очищених риб в юші господного дня. Знак милосердя і сліз, без благодатного знаку, не, дотар, не дотаркайся, це ніж музика, що убива. Це вже не просто слова, це та поезія без слів, де трава омива лезо небес. Knife. A knife to slice bread. A knife to carve a whistle. A knife to finish killing the lamb wounded by the wolf. So naked, dry, and lean, the clean surface of fish foams with sweat in Sabbath day broth. A sign of mercy and tears. Don't touch it without a blessing. This knife is music that kills. These aren't just words. They're poetry without words, where grass washes heaven's blade. Thank you. Slava Ukraini. I'm speechless from the reading. I'm just speechless from the reading. Thank you. Um, thank you for bringing uh, Natalka's poetry back to us. Uh, and I honestly, I honestly, I, I really, I really admire this collection. I really admire this collection so much. The poet, I think it's, it, this poetry in particular speaks really deeply, deeply to me. And um, I hope you'll come back and read more of Natalka Belakurfitis with us. Um, your fantastic, fantastic additions to our community. And I'm really grateful that you could be here today um, to bring, um, to bring Natalka's work to greater consciousness, to more poets. Uh, the, the more poetry that we have of hers, I think the stronger we all are. I think the stronger we all are. Thank you very much, Ali and Zinia and folks, a reminder, you can, you can have your own copies of the poem, all the poems that you've heard today. They are from Lost Horse Press's Contemporary Ukrainian Poetry Series. Um, 
an incredible uh, labor of love and love of labor uh, from both Christine Holbert and Grace Mahoney bringing us that series informations in the chat, as well as we also encourage you to support um, the poets of Ukraine through, through uh, contribution to pen Ukraine information on how to do that, as well as um, there's other information about other ways you can contribute to humanitarian relief is also in the chat. Well, much to my deep sadness, it, it appears that for whatever reason, we were not able to get the Krasonskis with us today. I, I know that they've been trying and I don't know what's going on with Zoom. I'm, so I'm very, very sorry about that, my friends. Um, I would like, however, to end our featured writers for today with Boris Kierzonski's translator, who was very, very gracious to join us today to be in community with Boris. And I'm, I'm, as, I'm, I'm disappointed that we couldn't have the, two, the, the four of you, including Ludmila and Diane, together in the room um, as we had hoped. But please welcome uh, Boris Traluk. And Boris has translated Isaac Babel's Red Cavalry and Odessa stories, both from Pushkin Press. And Mikhail's, Mikhail Zoshenko's Sentimental Tales from Columbia University Press. He is also the author of his own collection of poetry, My Hollywood and Other Poems from Paul Dry Books 2022. Boris, thank you so much for um, going with the flow of the reading today in hopes that um, we would be able to welcome your contemporary with us. But I'm very, very grateful to hear um, Boris's poems through your remarkable voice. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. I'm, I'm very happy to do this. Uh, very honored to be invited um, and uh, especially honored to share the work of, of Boris Kierzonski. You can see um, from his bio, which is shared in the chat, um, that Boris is by training a, a psychiatrist. Um, and um, I think that um, his deep sense of historical irony uh, is uh, partly informed by that training. Uh, I'm going to share just a few poems, um, but before I share them, I, I want to say that Boris is a poet like Ludmilla associated with Odessa, which was uh, for most of its existence, a largely Russophone town. But Russophone shouldn't mean Russian. Uh, it doesn't mean Russian. Um, the language spoken in Odessa is a, uh, is, is a form of Russian, but um, a tremendously idiosyncratic um, Odessan brand of Russian, which mixes elements of Yiddish and Ukrainian and Polish and, and really just all the languages of the world. It's a huge port, extremely diverse population. Uh, um, the fact that um, a number of cities in Ukraine are largely Russophone has been used as a justification for this barbarous invasion. Um, but the invasion itself is now killing that reality, both literally and figuratively. Uh, cities that are largely Russian speaking are being depopulated, destroyed. And the people who have spoken Russian nearly all their lives in Ukraine in comfort uh, are switching over to Ukrainian. And can you really blame them uh, for doing that? Boris is one of the people uh, who has switched over to Ukrainian in his writing, at least in part, um, uh, and, and did so after uh, the uh, Maidan uh, revolution. Uh, I'm, I'm going to read a few poems written in Russian in 2015. Uh, the first one I'll read in Russian, and then the rest I'll read in, uh, in, in English in my translation. Утренний дождь сильнее, чем тусклый утренний свет. Бумажный кораблик плывет, раньше он был портрет правителя, но его сложили особым образом. Вот он теперь бумажный кораблик, 
не знает, куда плывет. Какое странное лето, ни солнышко, ни тепла. Дождь зарядил с утра, жизнь была, да сплыла. Плывут по течению мысли и фильтры от сигарет. Плывет бумажный кораблик, раньше он был портрет. This morning's rain overpowers the dim morning light. A paper boat floats on the current. It was at one point the head of state's portrait, but folded just right. It's a boat that knows not where it floats. A peculiar summer, no sunlight, no warmth. Been pouring all day and life wouldn't stay. Thoughts and cigarette filters also drift off. A boat, once a portrait, is floating away. Second poem. Our micro district is teeming with saints. Most are holy fools or martyrs. Some have done stints in prison. Many are alkies or suffer from other complaints. Whenever they give us their blessing, their fingers leave prints. A shame that the Lord grants his mercy mostly to others. But the view from the big house can never suit you. That all of us end up in fetters, doing hard labor. That our neighbors all hate us. That it's probably mutual. And the third poem in this small series. The earth is reflected twice in the sea and the sky, three layers of reality that can't be split. As soon as you land in this world, you're hung out to dry. Digging a grave is the same as making a bed. This whole thing is a trap, no way out but to die. This whole thing is a flop, a flapjack, flimsy and thin. In the wind, scraps of thoughts fall to the pavement and fly. No final farewells. Tell life, we'll meet again. The last poem I'd like to read is also from 2015 and uh, is more rhetorically powerful than these three meditative lyrics. Uh, it's a poem uh, that uh, with great historical irony reflects on what usually happens after wars. Um, I, I, when reading this poem earlier in another uh, presentation, I, I mentioned that um, the heroism and also the uh, humanity of the Ukrainian army uh, tells me that this is not going to be the story after the end of this war. Um, but uh, I think it, it serves to remember um, that war is not the end of violence. When victory is ours, the post-war executions start, the hasty meetings, the tribunals passing sentence. We need to think, thin the ranks of all these prisoners of war. Why should we feed the generals we vanquished? They've got as much blood on their hands as all the rest. We have the orders that they gave their men. The urge to murder is a form of sexual lust. You just can't stop. You want to, but you can't. And so it's up the ladder, hands behind their backs, with pastors, priests if they should happen to be Catholics, bags on their heads, nooses around their necks, die scum. In seven decades, you'll get YouTube clicks. Five minutes and a man is a dead body. Another five, the coffin is nailed shut. War criminals deserve no hint of pity. A strong rope is enough or a sure shot. The executioner, his skill is our great hope. Prison's expensive. Killing simply costs less. The only justice is the bullet and the rope. The post-war era knows no other justice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Boris, and thank you for all the context. I, I, I've been getting so kind of swept up um, in hearing all the poetry that I also neglected to read Bor Boris's, um, Boris's bio, um, which we did put in the chat. But I, I, I want to just remind you and acknowledge that um, Boris Traluk has been sharing the work of Boris Cherzonsky, who is widely regarded as one of Ukraine's most prominent Russian language. And as Boris shared, there is a context to um, how, how, the, how, the, how the language that Boris is working in 
has been multifaceted through the through it is it is not it is not it is not Russian. It is it is an amalgamation that comes from the connections um, between and amongst the languages. It's important to note those um, those those realities. Uh, not so subtle if it's your if it's your home language that you're writing in, and particularly if you feel like your home language is under siege. Um, Boris Kersonsky was born um, in Chernivtsi and had spent most of his life in Odessa, where, as Boris said, he practiced he practiced medicine at a psychiatric hospital and taught psychology at a Odessa National University. Uh, after the fall of the USSR, um, he published many books of poetry, which been translated all over the world. So we are um, incredibly, incredibly fortunate to be able to hear the voice of this most significant poet um, who has in fact here in the US appeared in the New York Times, the Atlantic Monthly, and modern poetry in translation. So, so you may have come across um, this work and a reminder that um, Boris's latest collection, which is co-written with his wife, Ludmila Kersonsky, is the, is the country where everyone's name is fear, which was edited by Katie Ferris and Ilya Kaminsky. And uh, Grace and I have been chatting a little bit behind the scenes and, 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 and saying, oh, let's, get, let's hope that we can bring them back to the program so that you can, you can hear them read at some point in the future. And I certainly hope that is true. Everyone, um, I would like to, before we move to the open mic, appreciate, uh, have you unmute and send our appreciation to the poets that we heard from today um, and not in the order that we heard them mm -hmm. but uh, well maybe I can do it in the order that we heard them. Mm -hmm. We first heard from Irina Starovoit and Grace Mahoney. We also heard from Vitaly Chernetsky and we heard Diane Sue sharing the work of Ludmila Kersonsky, and also we heard share the translations of Ludmila, as well as Ali Kinsella and Vinia Orlowski sharing the work of Natalka Bilozukovitz. I'll go ahead and toast it. Then, and then Boris. Raluk sharing the work finally of Boris Kersonsky. Thank you, everyone. Please unmute and share your deep appreciation for hearing this. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Bravo. bravo. Everybody was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, thank Sandy. You. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. It's been a real honor to host everyone and sorry for the technical difficulties today um, with our features. And, uh, but again, very, very grateful um, to, you know, to, uh, to have Irina join us and, 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 and Itali and, and Grace and Ali and Finia and Boris. Diane has been, just been exceptional, and I hope that you each, all of you out there, have been moved by what you have heard as we stand with Ukraine in solidarity today. Again, with thanks to Lost Horse Press's um, Christine Holbert and Grace Mahoney, the series editor of the Contemporary Ukrainian Poetry Series, you've been seeing in the chat ways that you can support Lost Horse Press, as well as ways that you can contribute to the relief efforts um, for 
our, you know, our dear siblings. And for some of us in the room, family members, um, you know, who, it's, I can't watch the news really. It's, it's too, it's, too, it's too painful to witness. Um, and yet I, I know I have to. Um, so please do what you can today to support, to support, um, really support humankind. I'm thinking about what that line of, uh, that line of Boris is um, about war is not the end of violence and really honestly thinking there are no victories. There are absolutely no victories here. Anyone who claims a victory in war is a coward. Anyone who perpetuates war is a coward. Beyond that, it's criminal. So there, there is no victory here. There is no victory here. There is just immense suffering and deep, deep sadness. Um, and yet we come together as poets to, to show our support, love of people that we do and do not know. That is like one of the beauties of poetry is the way that it can reach across time and space and borders to connect us. And so I'm really appreciative for those of you who wanted to come and share a poem in solidarity today. And I know there are many, many more of you that had hoped to read. Um, and maybe that just means we do another reading in the future. Come and read if you didn't get to read your poem today. I'm glad that we will get to hear from uh, 10, po 10 poets today in the open mic, sharing each one poem. And I know we're running a little longer than we had hoped, but I hope you will stay for the open mic to hear these voices. Um, I, will limit my, I will limit my remarks and just um, share names. I'm, I'll, I won't go into commentary. So first up we have Bill Fay, who will be joined after by Martina McGowan. Was it so, was it so long ago? Was it so long ago? A plague of errant arrows is this freedom, caught and bound in a quivering fist, with sirens too hoarse to wail in the buttery side of morning beneath Dante clouded skies. The elephant heart pounding, ringing our concrete bell, the sanctuary where mothers wept and dust played witness to trembling shutter-stopped eyes and quaking aspen arms, where mothers rocked their babies between heartbeats. Was it so? Long ago, was it so long ago? I can barely remember Chopin and hummingbirds and vodka in decanters. Back home, I pray, my primroses are in bloom. Mm, mm, mm. Wow. I think you're muted. I think I was muted. Thank you, thank you, sorry. Thank you so much, Bill Fay. And next we'll hear from Martina McGowan. Obrigada. Oh, to the muse in wartime. It does not ask us to work legislation bored to tears by filibustering procrastination does not ask us to bear arms or shoot at anyone with anything other than 
words and thoughts. It does not ask us to learn to dismantle assault rifles, just to learn a few forms sometimes equally as difficult. It does not ask us to march in parades with streamers and confetti, but occasionally to stand on a stage alone. It does not ask us to wear medals to display our worth, shards of metal our children will later lose or pawn or wallow in mire, slipping beneath barbed wire or learn to goose step in cadence does not ask us to howl at the moon covered in grease paint, clad in camouflage, although we might if the muses asked and we thought it would help the writing. It does not ask us to swim frozen lakes, plant incendiaries, or place limbs in harm's way, but to occasionally be humbled by critical words. The wars will come and go and come again. It is our way. But our work does not often ask us to fight with guns or even weapons of misrepresentation, although we can. It asks us to hold and tell the truth, to not turn blind eyes to life and liberty and justice, but to shine our lights into every dark corner and, to on, and onto all who suffer. It asks that we write and that we witness and that we record for those who have no voice. This is the calling of our muses in wartime and in all times, but there is always war and injustice somewhere. Wow, wow. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Boy, I am off on my muting today. I am, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just filled with the poetry. Uh, what can I say? What can I say? Um, we will hear, thank you, Martina. We will hear next from Harvey Sauce, and then we will hear from Julian Matthews. Okay, thank you. Uh, this poem actually, it, it it references Ukraine, but the Ukraine that existed in the early 1900s uh, when my grandparents uh, fled it as people are fleeing it now. So uh, this is called Sad Case of Helen's Guitar. Certainly it wasn't a Gibson she took with her, that guitar. Some love struck young pioneer might have whittled for her, placing it into her calloused peasant hands a going away present? I never learned where she got it from or when, while she was still alive and fiercely independent, or if anyone, a, perf a pioneer perfumed with menschkeit ever instructed her on how to play. I'm sure she wouldn't have recognized the shtetl hood of Fiddler on the roof, England's pine wood studio lot where the movie was filmed being a far cry from her Dnieper, or understood stage banter where she had faced starvation. That wasn't her Ukraine, not her bowl of borscht. I expect she just plucked out chords discordantly awaiting passage to New York. It wasn't until her steamer had surged halfway across the Atlantic that her kerchiefed good looks were discovered by a thieving boy chick named Semyon or Sam a fellow passenger to America who suggested he should hold her things for safekeeping. Doubtless he didn't boast the whip in hard boots of a Cossack or present as the sort of fellow to steal a 15 year old's guitar. Having already endured pogromatic betrayal of classmates, former friends, denouncing her as that dirty Jewish as per you case, my grandmother Helen never complained, accepting this loss as she did all her losses, family, town, country. Those few letters from Sam that found her in the Bronx, making no mention of returning her guitar and bearing no return address. Thank you. Thanks so much, Harvey. And next we'll hear from Julian Matthews. Hi. 
this is called uh, dogs of war mm. yeah. you see them at the park sizing up the competition barking out of fear or warning when they get close enough they smell each other's bums up such ardor in that odo sniffing what glorious messages are they divine just like plotting co-conspirators turning innocent patsies into assassins sussing out the next best depository window or the ideal grassy knoll do you suppose well nothing to snipe about we are all tethered in a way instead of a leash a social media stream its addiction to this algorithm screens constant checking and oversharing the dumbing down and doom scrolling stimulating pathways of dopamine all in this together and yet also very alone come now poets throw them a bone now is not the time for thoughts and prayers get to work don't hold back your silent scream share your screens let your words be seen make every verse an anthem a chorus let it reek of the shock and horrors you and i know what's coming death and grief and a million mothers sorrows voice out to save all our children's tomorrows if every dog of war must have its day then every poet must yank their leashes now and have your own say be bold be loud conjure up your sublime lines let's elevate this narrative to the divine thank you mm, thank you you need to unmute oh my gosh i can't i can't do it today oh my gosh i don't know what it is with me today thank you so much julian um for being with us and sharing your poem before we get to uh, our next poet thomas a thomas uh i just want to mention i just saw in the chat that uh indra amir the Nayagam is mentioning please send poems for uh upcoming edition of beltway poetry quarterly and i'd also like to share that um circ the the uh the literary journal that sandra clevin uh edits uh is also going to be offering uh a uh, an upcoming issue of uh, poetry in response to uh, Ukraine. So please uh, take, a, please consider sending to both those publications. And I'm gonna invite the, I'm gonna invite um, you to all put information in the chat about the call for submissions. Um, certainly uh, it's, it's great to be able to uh, have a venue for these poems that you're sharing today and those are two wonderful wonderful publications so next please we will hear from thomas hey thomas thank you thank you sandy um this This poem is sort of a moment, like, unfortunately, the the image of the girl burned by napalm in Vietnam. This moment of the news, I will never forget. So I've tried to capture it in a poem called Erasure. Four people, winter hats, gloves, man in street, woman 
on sidewalk with child and smaller child. Winter coats, boots, backpacks containing everything left to them. Walking quickly away from shaking earth, bombs, artillery, shells, not running, not slipping or tripping or knowing how many miles they must hurry and whomp. A nanosecond, light, smoke, dust, three bodies on the sidewalk, a man just erased, all gone silent, aerosols of blood and bone. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's it's honestly is moving to hear all of you in the live open mic um, to kind of have this call and response to the poets that we heard in our featured our featured readers. Uh, it's my pleasure next to welcome Linda Olson Graham. Oh, hi, Sandy, and hi, everybody. What remarkable poetry to hear on a Sunday afternoon. I'm, I'm touched really deeply by what everyone said. Um, my writings, poetry, and a book, and one of my websites are titled Earth, Ocean, Heavens. And the topic, the main focus of my writing is about how peace can be achieved and the weather patterns can be calmed. I've added coming, I mean, um, ending terrorist attacks and insights into curing and eradicating the pandemic. So this is a condensation of some of my writing. Here and now, it's our choice how exactly life unfolds. The entire planet could realize we create the essence of the joy. Has the time arrived when humanity is able to digest the remarkable reality of just how simple it could be to shift the Earth's vibration. Teilhard de Chardin, the French philosopher, created the word newosphere to describe a layer of thought that hovers above nature and acts as a universal consciousness. It's what people think of as the one mind or the collective consciousness. Chardin actually felt that our thoughts go up to an energy field and are reflected back. And that was what, this was 1993. Oh my gosh, more than 28 and a half years ago, I came up with the philosophy that if enough people could quiet their thinking minds just for a few minutes daily, it would quiet that energy field around the planet. And incrementally, I believe it's a formula for global peace and healing. So two lines that I wrote 28 years ago, when a flood of writing came through, one is crisis can bring about an evolutionary leap. Another one is there are laws of manifestation. We in fact are co-creators and can more fully actualize our experience. The night of day tells me I'm feeling more than words can say. Stars reflecting cosmic wonder in the intonation of our choice, help. Beauty is in all our surroundings. We are in heaven if we so choose. Let light spring forth from minds of men to show the world the way, mindful of the gifts we have, ready for the day. Please hold the thought with me that peace on earth and calmer weather patterns, healing on all levels, can easily happen in a moment or two of silence in enough of the collective mind. Thank you so much. There you go. Thank you so much. Oh, sure. And reminding, 
reminding us also that uh, that in addition to time of violence against humanity, that the violence that we also perpetuate against the earth has a connection to that. Oh, truly. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Oh, thank you, Sandy. We will hear next from Gordon Ferris. Hello. Uh, this poem is this poem is uh, I wrote during a, a workshop I was doing with Kevin Higgins. Most of the poems that I wrote for this now were were about my daughter who's been seriously ill lately, but th this one is the exception. It's called The Worst Thing About This War. The worst thing about this war is how the people look like you and I. How we can look at the sky and not fear what's falling on, on us. How they can all leave except for men of fighting age. Did they once think it couldn't happen to them the way we think of it will never happen to us? Would you volunteer to take arms or possibly die for your country? Let your child become an orphan? Let your soulmate go on alone? Will these times bring forth more legends or is it to be more loss of the innocence? Will more heroes be born or bl blood lost on the battlefield to fill the coffers of suited men who press the buttons and treat us all as pawns in their parlor games? I look at the pictures of a world gone, of loved ones living in my heart in darkest times. I call upon them when all begins to fade. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gordon. And really, truly, uh, thank you to, uh, we've got a few more readers. I just wanna remind you in the room, we have, we have, we have people here from literally all over, all over the world, all over the continents. I know New Zealand, Australia, um, you know, Irina's joining us, uh, still with us. It's, it's very, uh, it's very, very late for some of us uh, from Ireland and from, of course, the U.S. and um, many different parts. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not um, illustrating all of them. I am I am here with you. Sorry that my camera is switched off, but it's too late here to, to yes, still keep yes. on. Yes, it's important to let people know that uh, for Irina, it's it's uh, it is uh, with some risk to be here uh, to have the camera on, and have lights on, and things like that. It's important to let folks know. So uh, again, I want to thank everyone for staying um, through the open mic. And we next uh, go to Alexandra Zarapalu. It's great to have you with us today. Thank you. Um, I just like to make sure, can everybody see the graphics going by? Yep, I've got them. Oh, thank you, okay. okay. In the temple high above the sea, the sweet gentle breeze blows through the orange curtains. And here there is a sweet flame burning in every heart, melting all resistance under the powers that guide us through sorrow and joy within and without, knowing how not to hurt or be hurt by others to be proud of ourselves on earth as above, unable to understand, unable to bear cruelty, using our strength to protect, to care for, dancing, dancing, to diffuse, in the waves, over the waves, transcending, higher and higher, wounds, no more wounds, in the sunlight, flying, flying, in the super light. In the temple, high above the sea, the sweet, gentle breeze blows through the orange curtains. 
And here there is a clean energy in every flower and tree, soil and water, wind and sun, our duty to our planet, knowing how to sustain and be sustained by nature, to be proud of all business people on earth as above, unable to understand, unable to bear war, using our kindness to soothe, to comfort, dancing, dancing, to transform in the waves, over the waves, transcending higher and higher, wounds, no more wounds, in the moonlight, flying, flying, in the super light, in the temple, high above the sea, a sweet, gentle breeze blows through the orange curtains, and here there is a safe haven for every child, woman, and man our duty to mankind, knowing how to treat and be treated by others, to be proud of all rulers on earth as above, unable to accept, unable to bear degradation, raising our human hearts to be noble, to create values, dancing, dancing, to be sublime in the waves, over the waves, transcending higher and higher wounds, no more wounds in the starlight, flying, flying in the super light, in the temple high above the sea, the sweet gentle breeze blows through the orange curtains. And here there is a unity of people from all nations, unlocking the gates of our minds and our hearts into salvation, knowing how to forgive ourselves and others, to be proud of humanity on earth as above, unable to accept unable to bear discord, raising our human souls to be noble, to uphold values, dancing, dancing, to render sublime in the waves, over the waves, transcending higher and higher, winners despite our wounds, into the rainbow light, Flying, flying, in the super light. Flying, flying, in the human divine super light. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexandra. And of course, we love the accompaniment. <laughs> Beautiful to have some music with our poetry and poetry with our music. And they are, of course, one and the same and enhance each other. I practice with a classical guitar solo. Thank you. Thank you. We will hear next from Leslie Freed. And if Sandra is there and wants to make an announcement about the, about uh, Let me speak first. first. Or... Ha, is it okay if I read first and then? Yeah, let's get it. Okay, cool. Thank you. And my voice is loud enough then? You sound loud and clear, loud okay. and clear. <laughs> Okay, so this poem is called Dancing from Warsaw to Vilna in black and white. Ada Acker slid through my childhood, two wheeling on icy cobblestone. Her ghost strolls through my night, sipping Polish cocoa, breathing passwords to all the little locks. In 1943, 
she outran the killers. The rooms and the gardens pulled her tightly as if to say, she's one of us. When blinking at the sea from the cliff, she thought of the chipped blue teacup left on the bench and leaped. I returned to Warsaw. There she moans as wind aching through walls, calling to the other broken vessels of first light, vanished to the center of my skull behind the one great eye. The girl drags a trunk to the train, a flight of words, whispers in the station cafe. He touches her breast through wool. She gives him her eyes. It's rainy, but the butter sweet. 100 kilometers underground, red hot magma flows, loosening cobblestones by the bookseller's market, breaking the walls that border the park. Vows are always made at times like these. The war began when I was five. I had barely learned to talk in rhyme. We are here, we are here, was a ditty from those days, sung with pistol in hand. And Maricia, the nightingale of Legno Street, shone like a meteor with special light. I'm herding tired people now to the elevator, to a room where they'll be safe. Then I drop into a hole and am no more. All those I knew have passed with a shrug to the center of my skull behind the one great eye. And I have a note explaining a little bit about the phrase, we are here, we are here. And the note is, we are here, we are here is a reference to Zog, Zognit Chaimol as du gehst den letzten Weg, which means never say that you are walking the final road. It's also known as the partisan song. It is perhaps the best known of the Yiddish songs created during the Holocaust. It was written in 1943 by the young Vilna poet Hirschglick and based on a pre-existing melody by the Soviet Jewish composer Dmitry Pokras. And it was inspired by the news of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and, it, and adopted as the official anthem of the Vilna partisans. Thank you. And here's Sandy. Oh. Hello, I was very carefully videotaping Leslie. Um, we have been in this last week um, witness to these programs with the um, poetry of Ukraine and responding poems from the United States and elsewhere. And it inspired us to open for a feature in the issue of Cirque that will come out in June. Uh, we tentatively will call it Voices for Ukraine um, and invite uh, submissions. You can find where to submit at circsubmittable.com, a special section, the rest of the um, um, sections for different kinds of writing are closed. Only the one is open now until the 31st of March. So invite you to um, send in uh, these uh, beautiful, beautiful poems. Um, thank, and thank you so much. Thank you. And here is Sirk. If you, it is, if you have never, if you have not seen Sirk, it is such a gorgeous, gorgeous, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful journal, it's curated so exquisitely. You will be very pleased to have your work included in such exquisite company. Um, Indran, I know, is here, and I, I want to let you maybe say a little bit about Beltway Poetry Quarterly, also for your submission for uh, your call for submissions as well, if you can. Uh, sure. Um... We are open all year round, and um, and uh, so uh, there's no restriction when you send the poems. I put my own personal email in there, which is fine. You can send them to me, but I have two other editors who work with me, Sarah Cahill Marin and, and now Renee Garrity is a guest editor, and we all uh, work on the issue. Um, 
and we focus this uh, on translations, on reviews, and and original poems in English. So, we would like to publish poems in both the original language and the and the and the translation language, and um, and we have not published yet poems from either Russian or Ukrainian, though we publish from a number of different languages of the world. So we look forward. Um, so there's no restriction in terms of when you send the poems, but of course, uh, you know, if you have them handy and uh, we'd love to see them. And um, we just put out a new issue. You can look at it at beltwaypoetry.com and uh, we'll be putting out our next issue within um, probably in two months or so, probably by June. So um, uh, please send uh, three to five poems, whatever. There's no restriction again on how many. And we don't necessarily know yet whether we're going to call this uh, issue Ukraine in some form or another, but we would welcome very much having um, your poems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Indran. And everyone, I want to thank you all for being here today. We heard on the open mic Bill Fay, Martina McGowan, Harvey Sauce, Julian Matthews, Thomas A. Thomas, Linda Olson Graham, Gordon Ferris, Alexandra Zarapalu, and Leslie Freed. And our features today, we were so honored to hear the work of Boris Kierzonski's work with his translator, Boris Draluk. Ludmila Kerzonski and her translator, Diane Seuss, Irina Starovoit and her translator, Grace Mahoney from Lost Horse Press, um, the curator of the Ukrainian, the contemporary Ukrainian poetry series, Ali Kinsella, Vinia Orlowski, and Vitali Chernetsky, would you all please unmute and show your appreciation for this amazing collection of voices today mm -hmm. as we stand as we stood today and continue to thank stand. you everybody. Thank you, Sandy. Bravo, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We send peace and, and Kim too. Love to everyone. I also want to just say, um, or just you know, my most heartfelt, um, my most heartfelt. I get choked up, you know. Like uh, I just want to know that Irina and that we were with you today in the best way that we all could come together um, for you and the people of Ukraine through poetry. And it's been an honor to be able to share this across time and space with you and everyone. Um, and I hope that we will continue, continue to hear poetry come through the most strongly, um, that poetry will be the thing that will continue to lift us through these times um, and that poetry will not only ease, ease, ease the violence and the suffering, but also bring peace, bring peace. I want to also share with you, uh, I was given permission to share with you today um, that a very, very dear friend of ours, um, Michael, in Michael Anthony Ingram, uh, had suffered a stroke um, earlier this, uh, earlier, uh, earlier, earlier today or yesterday, I'm not sure of the time and is in the hospital. And I just wanted to let you know that I've been in contact and, uh, and gave permission for you all to please send 
your love and care to Michael Anthony. Um, you all who know his work and know his being know he's the most beloved member of our community. And um, we're just sending out much healing to him at this time and healing to everyone who is enduring, is, in, is, is enduring what we humans endure in all of the multifacets that we do. Well, everyone, we will uh, we will be coming together again very, very soon. And I'm so grateful to have spent the time with you today. Thank you to Christine Holbert, Grace Mahoney at Lost Horse Press. We're really grateful to be able to bring the poetry from the contemporary Ukrainian poetry series, as well as the poets to all of you. I wish you much peace on your journey through this week. And to those of you here in the States, um, and some of you may be coming from out of the States, going to the Associated Writing Programs uh, conference this upcoming week, I hope you have a wonderful time. Uh, you'll get to probably meet some of our members in person for the first time. And won't that be really remarkable? Have a great week, everyone. And as I always say at the end, you know, please stay safe, take very, very good care of your beloveds. And of course, do what you all do so well. Of course, that's listening, but keep writing. You're very remarkable and much needed poetry. So Sandy, you know, send you much peace and love. Be well, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Thanks so much.